first of all, to try to provide a global context for the tremendous changes that are going on in higher education all around the world. Because we are in the middle of an academic uh, revolution, then I want to place those changes in the context of the research university, basically. We are in a research university here at SMU. And Singapore, I think, has done a remarkable job over a rather short period of time, actually, in developing several world-class research universities. So the challenges of the research university in the 21st century are quite salient and significant to this country. I will not be discussing specifically the Singapore context, about which I know relatively little. And thirdly, I want to reflect, probably for just a few minutes, on two very interesting locales, which have in themselves a good deal uh, uh, of elements in common. And those locales are Boston and Singapore. Uh, and try to point out some of the economic, political, mainly educational realities, challenges, prospects that these two seemingly quite different places uh, provide. So let me start with the academic revolution. There are, I think, two key elements that underlie a complex reality. And those are, firstly, massification, the tremendous expansion that has occurred in higher education around the world in the last half century and accelerating at the present uh, time. From a historical point of view, this massification is truly revolutionary. Without question, the biggest change in thinking and in the reality of higher education, at least since the invention of the research university in Germany in the first part of the 19th century. So for most of its history uh, of almost a thousand years, higher education has been a preserve of the elite. That is no longer the case. It, it is now uh, an expected right and indeed a significant necessity for large sections of populations in many countries. And by the way, massification cannot be resisted by governments or any other authorities because it's a demand that comes from the bottom up. People want access and they will get access. And no country can say by regulation, we're going to let 20% or 30% or whatever number is, whoever wants to come in the long run will be able to have uh, access. There is the diversification of higher education institutions and the emergence in many countries of systems of higher education. In other words, all, universe, all higher education institutions are not and cannot be universities. They must be, there must be a differentiated system. I am at the present time involved in a research project uh, funded by the German Rector's Conference to look at how higher education systems are organized in 10 different countries. Why are the Germans thinking about this? Because they have so far failed to develop a coherent system in Germany. They, of course, invented the university and the ideas of Humboldt back from the 19th century remain very strong. And the German ideology of higher education is that all God's universities should be research universities. And that is no longer practical. And the Germans have finally woken up 
to that reality and are trying to think through how they can have a more rational system. We think of the Germans as being well organized. They are, but not in higher education. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting set of uh, developments. But massification means the diversification of institutions. Massification means more diversity of students. No longer do universities only educate uh, the elites from relatively high income families with significant amounts of social capital uh, within them. They're educating larger groups of people from very different backgrounds, uh, often first generation um, uh, attenders of universities, and that places significant challenges that most higher education systems, as a matter of fact, don't deal with uh, very well. But that is a reality and a necessity of, of the, uh, the mass uh, uh, system. Massification means that dropout rates, non-completion, to be slightly more polite, uh, are going to be significant wherever mass higher education occurs. That's just going to happen. The dirty secret, I think, about American higher education today is that we do a very good job of students who enter the system, we provide for them, but we don't do a very good job about completion. Significant numbers never graduate. The, the new normal in America is finishing a four-year bachelor's degree in five or six years, and people think that's just fine. By the way, it's a huge economic waste for the country and for individuals. That's another story. Um, but uh, massification means dropouts. That's probably inevitable. And I think massification means an overall lowering of the quality of higher education in essentially all of the countries where it occurs. And that sounds weird, but it's, I think, quite true. That does not mean the quality of an education at Singapore Management University or Harvard or the Humboldt University in Berlin is lower. In fact, it's higher. These institutions and the elite institutions in most places have improved in recent years. But the overall quality of systems, including ours in the United States, is probably on average less excellent than it once was. And that just makes logical sense because of financial uh, problems, because of the diversity of students, uh, and because of a deterioration in the quality of the faculty. In most countries, I think Singapore is an exception, there are tremendous shortages of academics. And my guess, no data available of a significant sort, is that the, the average person who is standing before a classroom today all around the world has as a qualification a bachelor's degree, and in some countries, even less. Less than half, well less than half, of Chinese academics have a PhD. Significant numbers don't even have a master's. And you can go to developing country after developing country, and similar things, with some exceptions, uh, are the case. So the overall quality of the academics has declined, and there's a tremendous need for ramping up, maybe not here, largely not in the USA, ramping up graduate education. Indeed, one of the interesting challenges worldwide is the development of, of doctoral studies in universities that haven't had significant doctoral programs in the past. It's a significant challenge. And a number of countries are moving to do this because they realize that they do have vast shortages of, uh, of academics. And by the way, we did a study a few years ago uh, our center in Boston, in collaboration with the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, 
of academic salaries in 28 countries. And the story, you may not be surprised to hear, is not a happy one. That in, in uh, and, and by the way, among the 28, guess which ones were the worst paid? China and Russia. And of course, we, they're big data problems, and we can have another lecture on this sometime. Uh, but, and, and in no country, no country among our 28, were academics paid at the same level of similarly qualified professionals on the outside who are not employed in, in, in universities. So it's difficult everywhere to get the best and the brightest to join the academic uh, 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 profession. We used to see academe, and to some extent we still do, as a calling. And I wonder if that's very much the case uh, anymore. And the final point about uh, massification uh, is the growth of the private sector. In country after country, all of Latin America, almost all of Latin America, much significant parts of Asia, including parts of Southeast Asia, the majority of students are now studying in private institutions. Most of those private institutions are in point of fact for profit, and very many of them uh, are of rather poor quality uh, and in the business as a business, not as an educational service. So trying to manage the private sector for the public interest is a significant challenge in very large parts of the world. This involves quality control, quality assurance. It involves legislation that will put limits on the for-profit private sector. By the way, we have significant problems in the United States along these lines, uh, and so on. But the growth of the private sector has been quite significant in this respect. The other part of the global academic revolution uh, is the emergence of a global knowledge economy. Singapore, of course, is at the center of that global knowledge economy. Your economy depends on it. You have built, I think, an impressive infrastructure in this country focusing, understanding the reality of that global knowledge economy. Um, and the global knowledge economy is in direct contradiction to the challenges of massification. The global knowledge economy means that one has to have universities, and my argument is you have to have them in almost all countries. There's lots of disagreement about that. Top universities, research universities, that can compete and cooperate at the highest levels of knowledge, scientific development, links between the broader society, the economy, uh, and the global economy as well. Uh, so you have at the one, on the one hand the pressure of massification at the bottom, and you have the pressure of building or maintaining research universities at the top of, uh, of the system. Now, research universities, I'm and I'm going to spend a few minutes on them, are a very small part of anybody's academic system. And I, I think in Singapore, they are a bigger part of yours than is the case in most other places. And it's for Singaporeans to think through what's the right number of research universities that this country needs and can afford. Globalization has its biggest effect on these research universities. They are the institutions which are educating international students for the most part. They are the universities that are exchanging faculty uh, around the world. They are the universities that are, that are part of the global economy most directly with their research, um, uh, with their teaching programs, and so on. These institutions are the ones that have a globally mobile academic labor force. And you can see that 
of course, vary dramatically in a country like Singapore, where significant numbers of non-Singaporeans work in the higher education sector, I guess here at all levels, actually. Um, but in most countries, uh, uh, it, it is in the research universities that the, there's the largest mobility across nations. These are the universities that, that have the major international student flows. They are the ones that are mostly, not exclusively, educating students uh, from abroad. They are the institutions which need, need to deal with the revolution in what I call, what many have called, global English. Not a problem in Singapore, where English is the language of higher education, but a big problem, a big challenge in lots of countries all around the world. I think a strong argument can be made that in the rapidly changing workforce environment, the changing economies of the 21st century, that the kind of education that universities have traditionally done that provides people with actual knowledge, the ability to think, the ability to communicate, the ability to write, what we in the United States would call the good liberal education, is central to the broader concept of workforce development. Because people will be changing jobs over their careers um, a number of times. And the old way of thinking about training for a particular occupation, working for a company in the long run for, for, for a career, is no longer reality in most places. I know people in Singapore are thinking about this. Yale and US is an interesting example of some new thinking, which is going on uh, in this country, within all the discussion about workforce development. Massachusetts and Singapore have similar populations, about six million. The Boston area, uh, metropolitan area, is about three million, so it's smaller than Singapore, um, but uh, generally speaking, kind of comparable. The economies of the two places are actually interestingly similar as well. Uh, the Boston area thrives on financial services, high-tech innovative industries, including information technology and biotech, medical services, both in terms of basic medical research and in terms of the provision of health services to people both from Boston uh, and the area and from all around the world and I know that's the case in Singapore, and higher education, which is a major industry in, in the Boston uh, area. Singapore has done careful planning and considerable targeted investment in various areas of its economy. Boston has not. There is no evidence at all that the state government of Massachusetts or the federal government has thought in any serious way about coordinating these key elements of the economy or supporting uh, uh, higher education. Indeed, the state of Massachusetts uh, underfunds its public university system very seriously, the University of Massachusetts system. Um, uh, and. Um, it, 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 while the main campus in, at Amherst uh, is a decent research university, uh, it's not world class. So by and large, Boston has evolved without much coordination. Some Boston realities are quite interesting. Um, uh, Boston, um, sorry. Uh, 
Uh, Boston has the entire American economy behind it in the sense that its internal market is quite large. Singapore does not have that. Singapore has a regional market which is uncoordinated, developing, and absolutely not of a very high sophistication level. So how Singapore functions in its bigger market is an interesting uh, question. Boston does not have that particular problem because it has the uh, internal US market behind it, um, and it has strong ties to Europe. It's the, the closest, geographically, the closest part of North America to Europe, and I think culturally also the uh, closest uh, part to Europe. And should Mr. Trump win the election, uh, uh, by the way, don't laugh, it's a distinct possibility, um, uh, I, I think I will be the first person to advocate that, uh, well, a month ago I would have said to advocate that we should go back to our mother country, Britain. <laughs> but now that Britain has decided to exit Europe, uh, maybe Massachusetts and New England should uh, join with uh, Germany or some place. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the, 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 the advantage of being geographically close to very well-developed and large economies is, a, is very significant and a significant challenge to, to Singapore. Not a killer, but a challenge. Um, uh, Boston has a rich and diverse higher education and science ecosystem. There are about 54 colleges and universities just in the Boston metropolitan area and about 250,000 students. I was asking around how many students are there in Singapore. Maybe somebody knows. Uh, I don't. Uh, most of the Boston area institutions are private. It's very interesting. Um, the public universities play relatively little role in the research uh, sector. And by the way, Massachusetts is the only state in the United States that has a majority of its students in private colleges and, higher uh, 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 and universities. Of course, Harvard and MIT are at the top of the Boston academic ecosystem, but there are a significant, a significant number of other top universities that come along right, right afterwards. Boston College, my own institution, Boston University, Tufts, Brandeis especially, these are all highly ranked, private, research-oriented institutions. Interestingly enough, um, Harvard and MIT operate in their own little universe as if they were existing on the moon, <laughs> not in Massachusetts. Uh, the other research universities in the area closely collaborate, and this may be a lesson for Singapore, um, that we share libraries with uh, seven key uh, universities, research universities in the Boston area. We do a lot of purchasing of materials and scientific uh, equipment. We share labs in some areas. We have joint degree programs in some fields and so on. So it's a kind of deep collaboration. Although, the, although these institutions are very independent, to some extent competitive among each other uh, and so on. BU and BC, which are located about three kilometers from each other along one street, um, are uh, highly competitive institutions, but we do collaborate on a whole, uh, a whole lot of things. Uh, Boston has three major medical schools, uh, including the number one hospital in the United States and maybe in the world, uh, Massachusetts uh, General, uh, and medical research, biotechnology, and the science faculties, especially of MIT and Harvard, have been key to innovation uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the region. Boston has a long history actually of this kind of innovation. The so-called Route 128 corridor, this highway, now completely blocked up with traffic most of the day, 
uh, that goes around the Boston metropolitan area, even in the 1950s, was uh, the, the first center, actually, of uh, computer development in the country. We were, because of bad planning, actually, uh, outstripped by the Silicon Valley later, uh, which also had greater access to venture capital. Um, but for a long time, and even now, there is this tradition in the Boston area of, uh, of, of um, uh, innovation. Recently, the Kendall Square area around MIT has become a major international center for uh, biotech, international um, pharmaceutical companies like Novartis and others have come, invested millions and millions of dollars in buildings in that area, uh, and, and, uh, and so on. Good evening, Professor. I'm Abhishek Bhatti from James Cook University, Australia, Singapore campus. My university is a, is a unique example of a, a public university operating as a private institute here in Singapore. And we face a lot of challenges, as what you've outlined um, uh, in, in, in your, uh, your very thought-provoking talk about, about institutions in the higher education sector. Um, what I would like to know more about from you is, what is the role of research for an institution like ours and others who are stuck in the middle of the run to, to, to become a world-class institution eventually? It's very difficult for a mid-range university to leapfrog into the top ranks. You need a lot of money. And my impression is the Australian government is not exactly <laughs> inclined to, to give that, that uh, kind of money. We have the same debates in the United States. Uh, and you know, universities um, um, uh, want, to, want to be isomorphic. You know, they want to go up the rank. And um, it's very difficult to break, to break into the ranks of uh, top research universities, no matter where they, where they are. And good public policy, by the way, in my opinion, including in Singapore, should prevent too many universities from becoming top, uh, be becoming research universities. They can't be sustained. They're too expensive. I'd like to thank Professor Altbach and the audience for a great Q&A.